John chapter 17, if you are following along in your Bible. This is the last of the five chapters that Jesus is making an, an awful lot of teaching or he's sharing with us a lot of teachings. John 17 is really an interesting chapter. You have to read it over about 15 times to get a handle on it, I think, because he's saying so much and there's so much to unpack that I will not get it all done, but I'll try to give an overview of this to encourage you in your walk with Christ. The thing you have to ask yourself is how important is this chapter? How important is Jesus' last prayer to the Father on our behalf? Well, how much do we look at it? How much do we think about what he's saying as he's getting prepared to die on the cross the very next day? And he's praying, interceding for us to the Father. What does he believe coming out of this chapter? Chapter, Our biggest what are our biggest challenges? Because that's what he's requesting his father to help us to accomplish, right? Is this prayer only for the ears of the father or was it not recorded for our benefit? And here's a challenging question. Are we trying to accomplish what he's praying for? Because he's praying to the father to help us to accomplish things because he's leaving. So do we understand what he's praying for and are we striving to accomplish those things? Because you have to think that these are the most important things he sees because he's stepping out. So there's six things, six points. Wow, maybe I'll get through it. Maybe I won't get through it. Ah, we got time. Point number one, Jesus prays for us to know both the Father and the Christ. And he does so in verse one through verse five. And it's important to catch that he wants you to understand who the Father is. It's, it's absolutely vital for your eternal life when you think about it. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. And to glorify is to obey, to do what God has called you to do. And in John chapter 10, Verse 17, Jesus says, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up. This commandment I receive from the father, from his father. God gives him that authority, that permission to be able to lay down his life. And that's what he's saying right here. You know, glorify me that I can glorify you. Because when Jesus dies on the cross in obedience to the Father, now he's calling for the Father to raise him from, from the grave. That authority which God had blessed him with to bring him back. And that would be found in Romans chapter 1. Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the, script, the spirit of holiness, Jesus our Lord. If Jesus would have, if, if there was no resurrection, then Jesus died on the cross without purpose. But because of the resurrection, we can see the whole will of God was for Jesus to go to the cross, to suffer and the resurrection glorifies the death of Christ because he freely goes to the cross and dies. And we realize through the resurrection, our sins are forgiven because of this. And so the father glorifies the son as the son glorifies the father, which is just, it's just absolutely beautiful. And, and, and in this, he's saying, I'm ready to go, right? I'm freely ready to go. Verse two, as even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. I'm doing this so that here's the purpose, so I can give everybody eternal life, everybody that who believes in me. And and God has given, right, us to Christ. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 44, and I'm really going to be flipping, so just write these things down. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It's through God. God draws us through the Old Testament. It's when people are tired of their life and they're saying, what is the purpose of life? Like, 
who created this place? We're asking the deep questions. Where do we go? Well, you got to go to God. And then God leads you to the Christ. And that's why we share Christ with the world around them. And we take them back to the Old Testament, which helps back it up. Truly, truly, I say to you, John chapter 5, verse 24, that he, I say to you, he who hears my words, right? What's that? That's New Testament. And believes him who sent me. What's that? Well, that's the Old Testament. That's where you come to an understanding who the Father is. Has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. When you understand who the Father is. And some people say, oh, the God of the Old Testament is horrible. They, they were killing nations and, and punishing the Jews and all of this stuff. No, no. There's the love of the Father in there. You have to come to an understanding. And in the Old Testament, it's pointing to the New Testament. Verse 3 of John 17, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the eternal life. You've got to come to an understanding of who the Father is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 the angels will show up on judgment day, dealing out retribution, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. You have to dig into the Old Testament to understand. And going along with John's class, you don't have to know everything to become a Christian. But when you become a Christian, then you start digging to learn more. You grow into Christianity, right? And that's the important thing to understand. And that's the important thing for us to teach other people. The scriptures teach eternal life. First John chapter 5, verse 13. I've written these things so you can know that you have eternal life. And that is an important point. The interesting thing here is that the Old Testament points forward to understand the Christ, right? It's it's all about the old, it's all about the Christ coming. It's about the Messiah. That's the Old Testament points forward. But when you start looking at the New Testament, it points backwards to the Father. And when you come to terms with the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament is saying he's going to die on the cross and Jesus fulfilling that, dying on the cross. Now you understand this has always been the will of God. And when I understand this is been the will from the very beginning of time it's the will of the father and the son for the son to come into this world and that's the point that i really need to get a hold of that's the thing that i really need to understand right there's my conviction that this is not a mistake this was planned from the very beginning by God himself, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was going to come and die on that cross to waken me up to an understanding, to see that's where sins are forgiven. Now I understand them both because of the death, burial, resurrection. Jesus glorifies the Father, the Father glorifies the Son. And I need to come into a deeper understanding of that. Because when I understand the Old Testament, it's helped me to understand this is the will of God to save mankind. I glorified you on the earth, verse 4, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Accomplished the work. John chapter 5. I'm, I'm trying to stay in John as much as I can. John chapter 5, verse 36. The testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, Jesus says. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me, that the Father has sent me. So Jesus had those works to accomplish, John chapter 14, verse 9 through verse 11. Here's Philip saying, you know, show us the Father. And what's Jesus say? Have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works. 
Jesus came to reveal the Father. And it was the will of the Father that Jesus, the Son, was going to die upon the cross. And it's in that obedient act of dying that Jesus fulfills God's will. In John chapter 19, verse 30, what does Jesus say? It's finished. And he laid down his life. It's finished. That was the will of God. So that the world can be saved through the shedding of Jesus' blood. Right there. That was that's how he glorifies the Father. And then in verse 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. There's that resurrection. And returning to, because Jesus has always been with the Father. You know, it's a, it's a deeper understanding of Philippians chapter 2. I do believe, not Ephesians, it's a Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through verse 8. Have this attitude, which was also in Christ, who, although, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, also, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him in the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Yeah, he was God. And he laid down his godly attributes to take on the form of a man so that he could suffer. And so he could die for our sins. In Matthew chapter 28, 18, Jesus says, all authority and power has been given to me. It's been restored now that he's been resurrected, right? He's accomplished. Christ glorifies the Father from the cross because of the resurrection, because we see the resurrection. And now we know this was their plan from the beginning. And that's why I believe he's praying for us to know both the Father and the Son, and what Jesus says is, if you see me, you've seen the Father. It, it is so important to see how the Old Testament and New Testament so blend together that this is all the will of God happening. You've got to grab a hold of that. And then he says, Jesus prays what? He prays to the Father to keep us together by the, in the authority of his name. It's in the authority of Jesus' name that we do everything in which we do. Verse 6, I have manifested your name, the name Jesus, to the, to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. How does the Father give, them, give us to him? Well, we have an understanding. I think uh, Matthew, what, 16, verse 17 well, verse 16, Peter says, you are the Christ. When you come to an understanding of who Christ is, Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven opens up your heart to an understanding. And he wants to open up the heart to everybody. It's not that he's going to resist. If you have an open, honest heart to dive into the scriptures, God's there too. Bless you with the wisdom and the insight to understand that. And when you keep his word, then you're moving, you're going places. Verse seven and verse eight. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. They received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believe that you sent me. Yeah. Now they, now they know. After all this time, they've now come to an understanding. Peter's confession, John chapter 6, verse 68. Jesus says, do you guys want to leave? After I said, you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood. What does Peter say? Lord, to whom shall we go? You've got the words of eternal life. That's what Jesus offers to the world, to your friends and neighbors through through you the words of eternal life 
do we treat this incredible book as it is the words of eternal life? And do we feed on it on a daily basis? The words of eternal life. Verse 9 and 10. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world. But of those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all things are mine. And, and mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. Because they have done what I've asked them to do. We glorify God through our obedience to Christ. And now look at what he says. I'm no longer in the world. He's as good as gone. It's the day before. But he always speaks with the authority that even though it hasn't happened, it's about to happen. It's going to happen. Nothing's going to stop this. The crucifixion. I am no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Yes, it was determined about the about Judah's situation, but he has protected everybody else. Where? In his name. There is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. John chapter 16, uh, verse 24. It's interesting what he said in last Sunday's lesson, and that is, until now you have asked for nothing in my name, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Now you can go to the Father and in my name, God will answer your prayers. And that's what you need to do by the authority thereof. That's what keeps us united, right? And Colossians does such a beautiful job. Yeah. I love what Paul says here. I mean, you got to have this thing highlight. You can't because there's too many scriptures here. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all of these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let Peace, the peace of Christ, rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. He names nine things right there. It's kind of like the fruit of the Holy Spirit, if you ask me. But he names nine things that we need to be working on and, and loading up with. And then he finishes it, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ richly, richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You obey this right there, 12 to 17. Uh, 16 to 17, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, Right? giving thanks everything for for everything to the father there's the unity right that's that's him keeping us in the authority of his name because it's through the authority in all our prayers it's always in the name of that's what we need to cling to Point number three, Jesus prays for the Father to guard us from evil. Now, this is really rich. If I don't make the point, if you if you find yourself in confusion, just email me, pick up the phone, call me, drop by, visit me. Don't be lost and go, oh, that guy's crazy. Well, maybe he is crazy, but he's trying to get a point across here. And it's in... 13 to 15, now, but now I have come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy 
made full in themselves. And I like what he's saying there, and, and that's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. He's saying, I'm going to tell you before these things happen so that you know this was not a mistake. This, my execution is something that I am purposely going to the cross for, for your sake. And he's saying in chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, knowing about the resurrection, knowing that all these people are going to be saved through his sacrifice, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's why he said that. So you know none of this is accidental and all this is purposeful and it's for you. This is what he's done for you. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. What is it? Uh, Philippians chapter three, verse 11. Where's our citizenship? Our citizenship, it's not down here. Our citizenship is in heaven I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil. Now, in, you really need to capture this one because it's not the evil one as some Bibles will. They add that word one. It's not the evil. It's not about Satan. That word evil is the word poneros. And it's about wickedness. It's about doing things that aren't righteous. It's about unrighteousness. The word poneros comes from the word toilsome. It's working for self, not working for God, right? And it's interesting because he uses this same word in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And for, for my simple mind to get a grasp on this one, it's idleness. Toilsome is doing something, but not accomplishing anything. If, if God's in it, if you're doing it for God, then you're accomplishing something. If you're doing it for yourself, you're not. And it comes right from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, where Satan in verse 1 says, indeed, has God said? He puts that doubt in Eve's mind. And she goes, well, maybe God's word isn't true. And then lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Ah, yeah, I'm going to chase after serving self so that I can be equal to God. And then when they realized they were naked, God shows up. And what's the punishment for Adam? Cursed is the ground in toil. You will eat of it all the days of your life. From now on, you are going to work by the sweat of your brow in toil. But when Jesus comes, he shows us, get into the, the rest of God and start working for God and quit working for the world. And he frees us from that toil. And he says, where? In Ephesians chapter 5. Because you know you go down the rabbit's hole. You get on the internet and all of a sudden you're chasing one thing and you're going after another one. And all of a sudden it's a, it's a half hour. You're watching uh, TV. Then all of a sudden it's two hours. And, you know, you're doing something and all of a sudden oh, the four hours are gone in my life. What did I just do? Because it's not so much wickedness. It's just burdensome. It's idleness. That's what he's warning us about he says so in ephesians chapter 5 be careful how you walk verse 15 not as unwise but as what make the most of your time because the days are evil there's so many distractions out there oh yeah but i'm working a job and i got it i like this in chapter 6 of, of ephesians because what am i supposed to do i can't always be just running around preaching the word like no but what does he say for the slaves in chapter 6 verse 5 
Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with, with good will. Render service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Take God with you to work. That's what he's saying. And in everything you do, it's, it's to be pleasing to God, not pleasing the boss. So you're given 100%. And because the boss abuses you, that's fine. You don't work for him. You work for Christ. And now you're not toiling. Now you're accomplishing something. You're setting an example of the way a Christian needs to be in this world. And he's, he, the boss, is looking at you. He, the fellow worker, are looking at you. And they know what's going on. Don't think they don't. But you're not the one that's sitting there gaming behind at the desk on the computer and the boss comes, you know, oh, oh. No, you're the one that's putting in an honest day's work. You're putting in more than an honest day's work because you're trying to please Christ. And that's getting away from the toilsome. That's getting away from the wickedness. And that's doing the righteousness, right? It's setting that example for others. And then, who is it? It's Peter. Because they're going to come along, right? First Peter chapter 3, what, verse 15? Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and with reverence. The boss isn't around. Like, come on. I get to show you this video, right? This is great, right? Like one place where Kathy worked, the, the, the warehouse staff, they always had their phone and they were always sitting on a box someplace. Sometimes watching whole movies, you know, unless the boss came, they were comfortable. But that's not a Christian's attitude. That's not a Christian's attitude. And what is Jesus saying here? He says he's praying. Guard them from pone ras. Guard them from this idleness. And I think one of the best scriptures for that. When you're tempted, because there isn't anybody around. When you're tempted, ah! 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure it. And I always say the way of escape is the word of God. Because the word of God teaches us what kind of slaves do we need to be? Hard working. And you're working for Christ. That's the kind of slave you need to be. That's the kind of servant you need to be. You need to be loving your enemies. You need to be loving your neighbors. You need to be focused on how can I glorify God with the things that I'm doing. That keeps me out of idleness, doing. So the word helps us to accomplish his will. Guard us from that evil. Give us the wisdom to understand and how to apply ourselves in this day of evil because every day is evil it's always dragging us down it's always getting us into the pit and you got to rise up and that's a prayer of christ knowing that's what's going to befall us then he prays to sanctify us in the truth of god's word verse 16 to verse 19 jumping back to john chapter 17 they are not of this world even as I am not of this world, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Well, that's, do you have John 8, 31 in your head? If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Go make disciples. Disciples are those that load programs into here. And you will know the truth and the truth will. Make you free, which is the opposite. If you don't abide in my word, you won't know the truth and you will be a slave to what? Well, he continues on in that same chapter. You're going to be a slave to sin, just like the Jews. 
because they don't know who the father is. They don't understand the Old Testament because they don't accept the new. They don't accept who Christ is. Sanctify us in the truth. Open our hearts to understanding the scriptures. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Ooh, don't like this one. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus came. Yeah, for what purpose? Don't think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish. I came to fulfill. You want to really understand who Christ is? Get into the law and the prophets. And look at all those prophecies. He understood them. He understood what he was going to have to do. He knew what he has to do to fulfill. I'm sorry. Did he tell us what we had to fulfill? I think I heard it mentioned this in this morning's class. Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Christ has told us what to do. How you do that is different from how he does it or how he does it or she does it. But you live a life of righteousness and as opportunities come, you're sharing that, setting the example, defending why you do what you do, reaching out when you have a chance. He's praying for that, that we sanctify, set ourselves apart. For their sakes, what does he say? Verse 19, I sanctify myself, that they themselves may also be sanctified. I think what he's saying there is I'm going to the cross, death, burial, resurrection. I'm doing that so that you can be cleansed and you can be sanctified through the word. I do not ask, verse 20, now, now he's praying for what our, our unity, our single mindedness. Verse 20 to 23, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. He's, he's asking on behalf of us in this day and age that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me, I in you, they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. There's that unitedness that we need to be and it has to be coming from the word of God. That the world may believe. Acts chapter 5, and it doesn't seem to last very long, but Acts chapter 5, isn't that what Gamil says? Someplace in Acts chapter 5, 38. So in, in the present case, Gamil says, I say to you, stay away from these guys and let them alone. For if this, <clears throat> excuse me, if this plan or action is of men, it'll be overthrown. But if this is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may be even found fighting against God. The church was unified. They were obeying the word of God. They were getting out into the community. They went through 200 years of persecution by the Romans. It wasn't until about the 5th century that things started to fall apart, that bishops started to take power, that the Catholic church started to rise up and started to control but up until the 5th century, the, the world could see these Christians were united. They were people of the book, of the scriptures. That's how the Muslims always saw us, people of the book. Because they did everything in the name of Jesus Christ. He's praying for that single-mindedness. Where am I? Verse 2. And, and the only way to accomplish it, verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one. And I have to say, well, what's that glory that God gave Christ? And I would say in Matthew is, is the scripture that I'm looking for. Where is Matthew? I know it's at the very beginning, but I can't see it. Okay, I got rid of Matthew and I went to John. Because I wanted to keep everything in John. In John chapter 1, verse 33, John the Baptist, what does he say? This is how I knew who he was. I did not recognize him, speaking of Christ, but he who sent me, speaking of the Father, to baptize in water said to me, 
He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified, this is the Son of God. And then Jesus promises us, I tell you the truth, John chapter 16, verse 7, it is to your advantage I go away. For if I go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And I believe that's what he's referring to in verse 22 of John 17. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one, because the Holy Spirit helps guides us into all truth. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. Lives in me, lives in her, lives in him. And we come to an understanding of the scriptures. And then we know how to apply it in our lives. Verse 23, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. It's almost poetry. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. When we stand on that united front, the world may know. Ephesians chapter 4. There is but one body, one spirit. You are called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. What a unifying statement. When you can say that one with pure confidence in, helps bring us all together. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me. Uh, underlying this, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of this world. I believe this is a really interesting concept that you really need to get, get a hold of. Because I believe this is the fulfillment. This is is fulfilled in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. You have come to, because God is looking for, what is, is that? John chapter four, uh, to the woman at the well. An hour is coming now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For such people, the father seeks to be his worship, to, to be his worshipers. He says to her, an hour is coming, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship, but you will worship in spirit. When you worship in spirit, where do you go? You have come to Mount Zion, city of living God, heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, to the general assembly, church of the firstborn. <laughs> I can say her name. The church of the firstborn where Karen is presently, where Betty is headed to. Where I want to go, I want to remain faithful to the end of my life. And with your help, I'll be able to do it. Without your help, I don't know. We need each other. But that's where we want to end up. To be with all the saints. The church of the firstborn, enrolled in heaven. To God, the judge of all. Spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. To the sprinkled blood, which speaks better. When you go to prayer, where do you go? You enter into the throne room. You approach the throne of grace to receive mercy. Jesus mediates. He intercedes for you. And so what his prayer is right here, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, to be with me where I am. To be with, when I get there, I want them to be able to be there. Why? So that they can see my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. You imagine that when Paul got stoned in the first missionary journey, he went directly to heaven, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 to verse 3, I know a man in the body, out of the body, don't know, 
who went into the third heaven, went into paradise, heard things he could not repeat. Paul went there and just checked it out. He, he saw, which just, it, that set him on fire. That's why I believe Hebrews to be written by Paul, because I know of no other person that has gone to heaven and came back down. We see John going to heaven and we see that recorded in Revelation, which is the same picture that Paul has in the, in the book of Hebrews. It's the same picture I need to get into my own heart and my own mind so that I get the strength to leave the throne room, the place of worship, to go out into the world and to serve others. Because whatever they do to me in this world out there, I know where I belong. That's my citizenship. This is who I am. Out here, I'm just a slave, just a servant, and I don't care what they think. But I want to share, want to save, want to be what I can be before the call. The call that Karen heard Friday. The family is very comfortable because they know her faith. And we hope to do a service sometime when we can all come together maybe by August, to remember our sister. But I can talk about that right now. Last one, Jesus prays. Okay, so he's prayed for our unity, and now he prays for our growth in love. Oh, righteous Father, although the, the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. They don't know you fully yet. They're going to come to that. But these know that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. He's praying that we're going to grow into a deeper understanding of who the Father is and a deeper understanding of who the Son is with the Holy Spirit within us. And that love grows. And for John, everything you look at in God, it, nothing is static. It, everything is growing. It's growing or it's dying. You're either plugged into the vine and you're growing, producing fruit, or you're detached. You're not feeding on the word and, and you're dying and you just need to get attached. In, in John chapter 21, verse 15, here's, here's that Jesus showing up on the beach and he's saying, Simon, do you love me? Well, if you do, feed the lambs. If you love me, shepherd the sheep. If you love me, feed the sheep. There's how you're going to grow in love, by serving the brethren. And as you learn to serve the brethren, you learn to serve the world around you and love grows. Sorry, it's a bit long. It's a, it's a heavy text. Jesus in his last hours with his last prayer for us to the father has hopefully, hopefully brought to our attention these requests, requests from him for our spiritual survival. This is what these guys need, Father. And it wasn't just for those guys back then. It's for us today. Do we respect his prayer by doing everything we can to work with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to fulfill this which Jesus has prayed on our behalf? To strive to have a deeper understanding of who God is, the Father is, so that we understand deeper the will of God. To do all things in the name of Jesus. To keep from idleness. By diving into the text that helps us to show us the good works that he created before the beginning of the world for us to be doing. To be sanctified. To be united. And are we striving to grow in love? by working together. No, really, I, I challenge you just to read this prayer for the next two weeks, every day, right? Just 
get a handle, get it deep. This is his biggest concern for you. His biggest concern for you that you understand. And this is the thing we need to truly be working on in our lives as we reach out to our loved ones and our neighbors. And that's John chapter 17. Thank you for listening.